Welcome to Online Worship with Sandy Springs United Methodist Church for Sunday, July 9th. I am Candace Johnson, our Director of Family Ministries, and I am grateful to be able to connect with you here today. This summer, some of our in-person worship services are not available to be live streamed, so we're excited to revisit our Faith Flow series in online worship. This is a series that dives into practices that form us as disciples. Practices including worship, connect, grow, serve, share, and give. I have a few announcements to share before worship begins. Next Sunday, July 16th, our in-person worship service is back in the sanctuary and will be live streamed. We will see the incredible gifts of our worship arts campers as part of our worship service. Speaking of gifts, we're also looking forward to enjoying the talents of the Just Because Gospel Quartet, a bluegrass band, in worship on August 6th. Um, that is Bluegrass and Backpack Sunday, where we'll bless backpacks. So mark your calendars not to miss it, and remember to bring your backpacks and other school supplies to bless. Now, as we turn our hearts and minds to worshiping God together today, know that you, just as you are, Wherever you find yourself on your faith journey are a beloved child of God, and we are glad that you are here. Today in our scripture, we are going to hear from the Apostle Paul, who is writing to the church in Corinth, and he's talking to them about generosity of their resources, encouraging them to give by reminding them that you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you may become rich. As we continue to move through our new faith flow, our system for how we can each grow in our faithfulness and our discipleship, Today, we're going to examine our own generosity and how we can grow in faith and in gratitude. So as we do that, I invite you now to rise as you're able and join me in saying the call to worship you find in your bulletin. We are gathered to give witness to the enduring realities of life. We have come to affirm that life is a gift that the gift is good, and that it comes from God. We are gathered to renew our hope in Jesus Christ as we travel life's long journey. We find God in the paths of our present and our past, but we also trust in God's love and our future. The same God guides us all the way, every day of our lives and beyond life. Let us praise God with our whole hearts and entrust our lives to God's hands. Amen. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. And this, not merely as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us, so that we might urge Titus that as he has already made a beginning, so he should also complete this generous undertaking among you. 
Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you, who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable, according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, no one who has much, no one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In this worship series entitled Faith Flow, we are indeed moving through our new discipleship system. It's a pathway that hopefully you've seen. Um, If you've been here, if not, we have more of these in the narthex and it's on our website. Um, But it helps name characteristics of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and then what it means to grow and to mature in our faith and the markers that we have for ways that we can do this. We are exploring each characteristic during this season and how we as a church and as individuals can help one another grow in our faith journey, knowing it's a journey for every one of us. So if you've been here the last few weeks, you know that one of the ways we are doing that is by asking you each week in worship to consider a prompt related to whatever our theme is, and then we have a water droplet that we're asking you to write your response on and leave for us in the narthex, and at the end of the series, we are going to have an art installation that will have your words, your heart, your prayers, your gifts listed so that we can all see that visually together and how we come together as disciples. Our very first week, our characteristic was worship. One vital way that we are disciples of Jesus Christ is that we gather and we worship together. And you wrote on your water droplets that first week, what helps you draw closer to God and worship? I've had the privilege of seeing those. They were powerful. In fact, they brought tears to my eyes. Many, many of you listed music, of course. You also wrote reminders of God's faithfulness, the children's moment, prayers, fellowship, the light streaming into the space, family, anything that involves active participation, music, prayers of the people, communion, sermons that help us live our faith, scripture, being together, finding my purpose in life, very powerful. But I will say, not a single one of you listed the time of offering is what brings you closest to God in the worship series. I didn't write that either, I'll tell you. I can't speak for everyone, but I'm guessing that the primary reason you showed up today has little to do with the moment when the ushers come around with the brass plates and pass them back and forth. If somebody says to you, why do you go to Sandy Springs United Methodist Church? Your response is probably not, well, the music's all right, the preaching is hit or miss, 
People are okay. I, I talk to them when I have to. But let me tell you, what gets me out of bed on Sunday morning is that moment when the ushers come around. I get to drop my check or my cash into the offering plate, and then we stand up and sing the doxology. If I miss that, I am thrown off all week long. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes to the church in Corinth a little bit earlier than what Virginia just read, God loves a cheerful giver. And brings to mind ushers walking up the aisle to the altar with a gift, followed closely behind two cheerleaders with pom-poms, everyone cheering and clapping. Maybe the wave happens. We have a hard time imagining this kind of unbridled joy in our service around the offering. There are places, there are churches, where the offering is a moment of unbridled joy. Kyle, my husband, um, and his former job traveled a lot for work um, and was privileged to go on a trip to the Ivory Coast. And while he was there, he attended a Methodist church for their Sunday morning worship service. The time of offering when he was there lasted a full 30 minutes just for the offering, and it actually started off with a marching band. Um, so the marching band came in first to set the tone for the joy and the gratitude and the gift of what it means to give back to God. And then the plates aren't passed around where people are sitting. People get up and they sing and they dance to bring their gifts forward to God. He said it was jam-packed with joy. Everything about that half hour, that full half hour, radiated with generosity, with gratitude. It was a highlight of the service, and it did indeed bring people closer to God. Can you imagine that? I know that some of you can. Maybe you've experienced worship like that before. I've also been privileged to hear many of you share what a gift it is for you to give generously of your financial resources, the struggles and the challenges that that can bring, but also the blessings that come. I've heard many of you share your commitment to tithing with deep joy, with a cheerful heart. But also, I'm aware that probably for many in this room, thinking about money might make you squirm a little bit where you are in your pew. You are also not alone if that's where you find yourself today. Maybe it makes you feel uncomfortable to talk or to think about money, especially in church. Maybe it brings up feelings of shame or of guilt. Money is really complicated in our society and in our lives. It can be a cause of anxiety. Well, that's why, friends, in each area of our discipleship journey, we have room to grow because we all find ourselves in different places and we want to help each other on this journey. So on our give section, you might find yourself in the very beginning just seeking faith. Maybe you give, you drop something in the plate when you're here at worship. If you're beginning in faith, maybe you make regular contributions to Sandy Springs UMC. If you're growing in Christ, you say, I completed a pledge card. I'm working up to a tithe. I'm exploring giving opportunities and legacy giving. And those of you who are maturing in Christ, give 10% or more of your income already to this church and respond with generosity to other mission and ministry needs. Each of us in this room experiencing worship online, we find ourselves in different places and our relationship to generosity. But wherever we find ourselves, one thing is clear. Generosity is an essential characteristic of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Money, possessions, generosity is mentioned 2,000 times in our scripture. 2,000 times. So we better pay attention, right? It no doubt shapes our faith and our relationship with God if it comes up over and over and over and over and over again. And we are generous friends. We are generous people. We are generous disciples of Jesus, not so that the local church can meet its bottom line, but because the practice of generosity helps us to know and to really believe that all that we have, it's not ours. It comes from God. And our measure of generosity becomes a measure of wanting to share that back, to make an impact on ourselves and on the transformation of the world. Here's what Paul says again in Corinth. 
For you know the generous acts of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter, I'm giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even desire to do something, now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. It is as it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. It's a beautiful letter to a church who is figuring out how to form themselves to be disciples in all kinds of areas. It's a kind of generosity that says, give what you have out of what you have so that all may be provided for. John Wesley, who's the founder of Methodism, took this injunction by Paul seriously as well. Wesley had a, sermons of three, a series of three sermons on money. One was called The Use of Money. He followed that with On the Danger of Riches and then On the Danger of Increasing Riches. Wesley was convinced that there was a direct connection between our discipleship and the use of our financial resources. Now, he wasn't anti-money. In fact, Wesley called money an excellent gift of God. He was clear that it's the love of money, not money itself, that's the root of all evil. And his challenge to those earliest Methodists in the mid-1700s was this. You may have heard these rules of John Wesley around money. It's earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Our son Sam turned five on Monday. And for the first time, at least the first time in his memory, he got um, a little bit of money in the mail from some grandparents and great-grandparents. He got one dollar bill first, and he was so excited, and then he got five, and then he got 20. He doesn't really know what that means yet or what it's worth, but he was so excited, and he said, now I can spend my money. And what I love about these rules from Wesley is we were able to say to him at five years old, very simply, when we have money, here's how we get to think about it, right? We want to We have our money, we earn it or get it at five. Um, And then we wanna save some of it so that we keep some for when we might need it. We don't wanna spend it all in one place, but we also give some of it away. We can bring some to church so that for people who don't have money or for things that have a need, we can give them. And he he could remember it back to us. You know, he said, okay, we, we save some and we give some. They're simple rules. But Wesley was really frustrated that the people who started calling themselves Methodists were pretty good at doing the first two. They earned a lot, and they also saved a lot. They didn't get real extravagant in their spending, um, but he felt like they were starting to hoard it up for themselves. So the focus of these last three sermons he wrote was about the give all you can. And when he was doing this, he wasn't fundraising for the Methodist movement. In fact, they were actually doing all right. The motivation was to lead people into Christ-centered lives. Because a biblical understanding of the relationship between our money and our faith begins not in what we do, right, but in what God has already done for us in Jesus Christ. We love because God first loves us. We give because God first gives to us. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Our generosity is a finite response to the infinite generosity of God. So followers of Christ find joy in sharing rather than hoarding, in giving rather than taking. And like any area of faith and growth and discipleship, giving and generosity, friends, it's a practice, it's a discipline, and it's one that we can help each other move through, and it's one we don't have to go through alone. There's a really impactful study written by the Reverend Jim Harnish, who's pastor of Hyde Park United Methodist Church in Tampa, Florida, and it's called A Disciple's Path, 
I led this two years ago, and some of you here moved through that study. It feels like it was 10 years ago, but it was the fall pre, pre-pandemic, uh, right before the world shut down. So two years ago, uh, a group of us gathered, and we had deep engagement around what it means to be a disciple. It involved daily scripture readings and questions for us to reflect on, journaling. We had open and honest and wonderful connection with one another when we came back weekly for our study. I'm planning to lead this study again in early 2020 if it sounds like something that would be interesting for you to go deeper. But I particularly love the advice that Jim Harnish gives in his section on financial generosity, one way that we are disciples. It is inspired and it's practical, and I want to share it with you today. He's, of course, inspired by Wesley's instructions on giving which are, of course, inspired by the generosity of God through Jesus and the 2,000 times that money and possessions and generosity comes up in Scripture. So Harnish lays out some rules for what it means to be generous financially. His first one is generosity begins with God. Generosity begins not with what I give to God, but what God has given to me. The Bible says that extravagant, self-giving generosity is the tangible expression of the love that is in the very heart of God. We are generous to others because God has been so extravagantly generous to us. The second rule is generosity is essential. It's not optional for followers of Jesus Christ. It is the spiritual discipline that shapes our lives around the extravagant generosity of God. Our use of money undergoes a fundamental transformation when we stop asking how much of our wealth we will give to God and start asking how much of God's wealth we will keep for ourselves. That one, friends, that one gives me chills, so I'm going to say it again. Our use of money undergoes a fundamental transformation when we stop asking how much of our wealth we will give to God and start asking how much of God's wealth we will keep for ourselves. If that's not convicting, I don't know what is. The third rule is generosity is intentional. It doesn't just happen. We don't come, become generous unless we plan for it. If we decide to become generous at the end of our spending, then we might not have anything left over. That's where the biblical practice of tithing comes in. Those of you who do that know that. Uh, Those of you who are working towards that know that. It takes discipline and planning, whether we have a little or a lot, to say, I can put this amount forward first. He also says, generosity grows with practice. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a learned behavior. It runs against the grain of the predominant mood of our culture. But it's a spiritual discipline that, if practiced over time, can enable us to break free from a self-centered life and grow into a Christ-centered one. He says, generosity is joyful. I've observed that, generally speaking, generous people are joyful, and he says, stingy people are grouches. When we give all we can, we experience the joy of knowing that through our generosity, we do share in the way that God is blessing others through us. And finally, he says, generosity results in blessing. He says, there's no promise that if you tithe, you will get rich. That's not what Wesley was talking about. That's not what Paul or Jesus are talking about. But the blessing comes, the promise is that when we develop the spiritual practice of generosity, we will feel blessed because we start to live out of a sense of gratitude, of recognizing what God has given us. And we know that we are helping to be a blessing to others. Ultimately, he says, a generous heart, that's our reward. That is our reward. That's a lot of rules, and I don't share them to be a burden or to be overwhelming. Um, If you'd like to see them or hear them again, let me know. I'd be happy to, to share them with you. But I wanted to share them for a sense of encouragement, for inspiration, for all of us to really pray about our relationship with money and with generosity, about how God is calling us to share our resources, to be able to live out of a spirit of gratitude and then to give in response. And to ask, to ask, not how much of our wealth we will give back to God, but how much of God's wealth am I going to keep for myself? 
not out of a sense of guilt or obligation or shame or to meet the church's bottom line, but because, because we know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty we might become rich. I'm sad to tell you this morning that we are not going to have a marching band start our offering. I'm wishing now that we had thought to pull that off. (laughs) But I do hope, I do hope that during the offering today, whether you have been putting a check in the plate faithfully for 50 years, or maybe giving for the first time online or here, or still thinking and praying about giving, you do so with a lightness of spirit, maybe a spring in your step, gratitude in your heart. And friends, if you find that you cannot keep yourself from dancing, I won't judge you. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen. As you go, I invite you to join me in responding to the benediction that you find in your bulletin. For all that God can do within us, for all that God can do without us, thanks thanks be be to to God. God. For all in whom Christ lived before us, for all in whom Christ lives beside us, thanks thanks be be to to God. God. For all the Spirit wants to bring us, for where the Spirit wants to send us, Thanks be to God. Listen, Christ has promised to be with us in the world as in our worship. We We go go to serve serve him. him. Amen. Amen.